started. So we have a we have a very important and, uh, and quite wonderful panel this afternoon on rules and responsibility. We have we have a, a very diverse set of perspectives. We have a, an editor, a lawyer, a blogger, an academic. It sounds like the first line of the joke. Yeah. Um, but but of course this is this, the last panel made clear. This is no joke. This is this is very important. How we arrive at the right sorts of forms of rules and responsibility. So uh, I'm going to first of all say that there's no break between this panel and the next panel, but I think we're going to try to end just a few minutes early so people can take a quick break. So I'll ask the panelists to try to keep within your allotted time frame so that we can have plenty of discussion and also end a few minutes early. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our first panelist. Amanda Gefter is an opinion editor at New Scientist Magazine, where she edits the books and arts section. <coughs> She's founder and editor of New Scientist Culture Lab, a blog about the fantastic intersections of books, arts, and science, and is a frequent writer on topics in physics and cosmology. She studied history and philosophy of science at the London School of Economics. As somebody trained in history of science, it's always nice to see somebody with a history of science background doing something important. And uh, she lives in, in uh, here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So. speaking about blogging in general. Um, so bloggers, I think we can all agree at this point, are a form of journalists and therefore share um, the same sort of responsibilities as traditional journalists do. Um, so these are just a few that are taken from the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. Um, it's a blogger's responsibility to provide accurate information, to identify sources, not plagiarize, support an open exchange of views, and to be accountable for the information that you put out into the world. But I think, um, as we've said, you know, bloggers are really somewhat more akin to op-ed writers, commentary writers, than they are to traditional news reporters. And so we have similar responsibilities uh, to opinion writers, including distinguishing between what's your opinion and what's fact, uh, distinguishing between sort of mainstream scientific ideas and more speculative ideas. Um, and then just as a matter of uh, good manners and trying to avoid libel suits, we should be attacking ideas and not people. Um, so, you know, having this huge blogosphere full of commentators, you know, if the internet's our new public square, then having all these commentators out there shaping public dialogue is a really powerful thing for democracy. Um, and of course you could say, well, science isn't about democracy, science is about truth, um, science is science, and it doesn't really matter what bloggers have to say about it. Um, which of course is true, but at the same time, um, I think what we all know that we're in for is increasing um, scientific literacy in the general public. Um, and that, of course, is important, as we all know, um, because it's directly linked to science policy, and it's going to end up affecting our lives, affecting how research is, uh, funds are divvied out, and how science is, is done. Um, so, in the in a place where anyone has uh, the ability to say anything that they want, um, there's obviously going to be a lot of crap, and we've been talking about that. Um, so, what can we do about it? What's our responsibility as bloggers to try and help readers distinguish between uh, good information and crap? And one of the things we can do is just provide information about our own bios um, and give readers like some information that can help them just decide whether or not we're trustworthy uh, bloggers. So this is just an example. Um, this is a guy named Nick Anthes who writes uh, The Scientific Activist. And if you just look at his blog, you know, you see that he um, was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. He studied biochemistry, uh, did a postdoc at the NIH, et cetera. Um, so you read something like that and you think, OK, I can trust someone like that. Um, that's useful, responsible information to have. And just to give one other quick example, this is a guy named uh, Roy Spencer. This is a global warming site, and if you read his bio, you see um, he has a <coughs> PhD in meteorology, he's a senior uh, climate scientist at NASA, testified before Congress, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, also a very trustworthy um, blogger, except in this case, uh, Roy Spencer happens to be a creationist and a climate denier. Um, so I think the, the message is, it doesn't always help, but I think it's useful to provide uh, your credentials. 
And just one other thing that I think uh, helps us help readers uh, distinguish between good and bad information um, is this little uh, icon that you see on the left here. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know this. This is research blogging. And basically, this is an icon that you can put on any blog post that's about peer-reviewed research. Um, and I think things like that are really a step in the right direction. And I think that maybe um, Chris sort of brought this up earlier, but maybe there are more ways that we can distinguish some sort of widespread metrics for um, judging the reliability of various blogs. And maybe that's where the future is headed. But I think this is the kind of thing that, that is useful to do. I mean, obviously, you can um, take peer reviewed research and make wild, uh, wrong interpretations of it. So it's not always going to help. But, uh, Okay, so there's going to be lots of crap, and this is a quote from a woman named Rebecca McKinnon uh, from Global Voices Online. This was on the Edge website recently, and I just like what she said. She said, I'm less interested in whether the internet's a force for good or bad or idiocy. It's everything all at once because it's an extension of human activity and the amplification of human nature. Human society has always been vulnerable to hijack by the worst aspects of human nature unless concerted, determined, and sustained efforts are made in the other direction. And I think that's where bloggers' responsibility comes in. Um, we have to make the concert, I mean, the crap's gonna be there, and we just have to make the concerted, determined, and sustained effort uh, to get good information to the public. If, if we don't do it, who's gonna do it? So, um, but I think we have to go beyond just putting out good information. We also have to call out bad information. Um, so I'm going to venture that it's a science blogger's responsibility to call out pseudoscientific bullshit. Um, so we have to call out scientists uh, for making you know, ridiculous claims. We need to call out uh, other blogs for perpetuating bad information. And we have to call out traditional science journalists, which I think is just as important. Um, these are just a couple of quick examples uh, of people who are doing this. So this is um, Evolution News and Views. This is the blog from the Discovery Institute, which is the premier intelligent design uh, think tank, if I can use that phrase ironically. Um, so this is a blog by a guy uh, named Michael <coughs> Ignor, who writes about neuroscience uh, and arguing that consciousness allows us to make is evidence for supernatural forces at work. Um, and here's Neurologica. Uh, this is Stephen Novella explaining why Dr. Ignor is wrong. Uh, this was an uh, interesting case, the Institute for Human Continuity. Uh, this was a research institute that was made up by Sony um, as part of the 2012 promotion. And so he was giving out, you know, quote unquote scientific information about how the world's going to end in 2012 when a large planet uh, from the outer solar system comes crashing into Earth. Um, and if you look closely, you can see it's part of the 2012 movie experience. But obviously, there's a lot of people out there who weren't going to notice that. Um, and so thankfully, we have people like David Morrison at NASA who created this blog um, in order to respond to all of the claims that were raised uh, on the Sony blog. And finally, this is on the Huffington Post. This is Deepak Chopra, which is real, the moon or God. Um, and spoiler alert, the answer is God. Um, and then we have, he just sort of used these ridiculous interpretations of quantum mechanics. Um, and then you find on To Visible by Pi, Deepak uh, Chopra misunderstanding physics since he willed himself into the system. <laughs> okay, so I would argue that blogs are really the best medium that we have for calling people out on their bullshit. Um, and the reason for that, there's a couple of things. One is just the immediate response time. Um, and I think this is really crucial. You know, if Jenny McCarthy goes on uh, <coughs> CNN and starts talking about how vaccines cause autism, and then you have worried parents across the country Googling vaccines and autism, you can have bloggers in real time responding to the claims that she's making. And I think that's a really powerful thing. And I just wanted to say quickly about um, the uh, Al Gore uh, cast on scene debate um, about whether or not, you know, the, the argument is that people um, only seek out information that supports their own ideologies. Um, and I think that that's true in a lot of media. I think that's true on television. You know, you can watch Fox News, you can watch MSNBC, <coughs> and you're just going to see what you want to hear. But 